Aloha and welcome to World of Books. This is a show on books that we think you should read. I'm your host, Mihaila Stoops, and today we're going to discuss Anna Clark's book, Poison City. This is the story of the water problems in Flint, Michigan. And to discuss this book, I've invited Kathy Davey, Juris Doctor and also former counsel for, I should say, inside counsel for the City of Tampa Water Department. Uh, Kathy is also a fellow West Nile Book Club member and real estate agent in Hawaii. Kathy, thank you so much for joining me today. Great. Thanks for having me here. Well, one thing that um, I thought after reading this book is that I've definitely taken for granted a clean cup of water. And I've taken for granted public water system. So why don't we discuss, why, why don't we start this discussion with um, three minutes 101 on public water systems, because that's your expertise, right? Right. So I got into water as a, an attorney first. I got into water conservation and the water department director asked me, why are you interested in water conservation? And I said, I used to live in a Zapotec Indian village in Mexico and you had to carry every drop of water about a quarter of a mile. I said, I know what water is, I appreciate it. And right at the beginning of the book, the author notes that water systems are magical and they really are. We, we take it so much for granted. We turn on the tap, Clean water comes out, and most people have no idea about the complexity of running a water utility. For example, it's heavily regulated by the federal government through the Safe Drinking Water Act, and you have thousands of miles of pipes. A water company or a water utility can make up to 40,000 of tests of water quality every year, 9,000 samples, and maintain the pipes, maintain the biology, maintain the chemistry, prevent the pipe from deteriorating with acidic or alkaline water. And there are a slew of engineers, biologists, chemists. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, huge undertaking. And most people just take it for granted, especially in the United States. Well, so it takes a lot of people to make it happen. And, but then it seems to me, based on the book, is that there were a few people that made the wrong decisions. And also there were a few people that, you know, kept to their morals and their ethics and they just did what was right. So in light of what happened in Flint, um, do you have more confidence in the local authorities, state, federal authorities and the professionals they employ? Uh, do you become a cynic or is there a silver lining here? I think what was interesting in the book, there, there's the bad guys and the good guys in this book. And the bad guys were elected officials who are very short-sighted and think about getting reelected. And in this instance, the city of Flint had been put under an emergency manager because Michigan at that point and the city of Flint was falling apart economically. And this was a non-elected official. So you had a non-elected official, and then you have normally elected officials, and they're making economic decisions. And then on the, the flip side, the, the good guys or the heroes um, in this case, you have the water quality engineers who kept saying, we're not ready to switch off of Detroit system and onto our own system. And in my experience, the engineers were the ones that were really serving the public. They had an extreme duty to make sure the water was safe. And the elected officials in Flint, and in my experience, they were worried about not raising the water rates, making sure they got reelected. And the water engineers and wastewater and stormwater, all the engineers trying to make the utility work were just nickel and dimed by budgetary constraints. And that, that was a problem here too. And obviously, these elected officials, they were experts at, um, I guess, working the system and manipulating the data, um, like when it came to number of tests and interpreting test results and things like that. 
Right. In this case, what was I found interesting is that the Michigan Department of Environmental Protection and the EPA, which is over top, EPA, the federal agency, has underneath it the state agencies, and both the federal EPA and the Michigan Environmental Protection Agency, both of those agencies, which are typically very, very concerned about water quality issues, they dropped the ball. And so I found that interesting. They're typically very, very dedicated people in that area. And in this case, in Michigan, there was one guy who wrote a report and stood up to everybody and his report got buried. Um, so I found that interesting that there weren't more environmental um, engineers or, or staff members that stuck up for the city of Flint. There, for me, there is a silver lining in this story and that is, you know, it only takes a handful of people to do the right thing. It starts with one and then it's like the snowball effect. There's another one that decides to do the right thing and so on. So it's, it, to me, the, it, it's very important to read what happened in Flint and learn from that experience, but it's inspiring activism. Right, in, in this case in Flint, it was almost the perfect storm of failure of a, of a utility system. First, you had the fact that the city of Flint used to be an automotive uh, capital of the United States, of the world actually, in terms of manufacturing the auto industry, which takes huge amounts of water. So the auto industry had dedicated pipelines. And then you had what happened in the, in the 60s as part of suburbia growing, you had what's typically known as white flight. So you had a lot of wealth leaving the inner core of the city and moving out to the suburbs. And on top of that, you had a poor inner city. And when Michigan started to go bankrupt and, and the uh, city of Flint went bankrupt, there wasn't a strong economic base. There wasn't, frankly, as, as the author points out, there wasn't a bunch of, of wealthy white people to say, hey, there's something wrong with our water. So you had a failing infrastructure, you had a poor, mainly African-American community, you had rich white people fleeing to the suburbs. So all of this was, was happening in the 60s. And at the same time, you had the environmental movement starting. So you had environmental protections coming down. So all of these things happened at once. And what people don't realize, they pay for water, but they also have to pay their share of the infrastructure. And you see this a lot when people get solar roofing you know, solar panels, they say, hey, why do I still have to pay the utility for my electricity? I have solar panels. So even if you have, if you're self-sufficient in solar, you still have to pay your share of the infrastructure of all the electric grid that gets you the ability to maintain your system and sell electricity back. And it's the same thing with the water system. And if your bigger customer, like the auto industry abandons their share of the infrastructure, all of that cost goes on to the, the residents. And in this case, it was poor inner city residents. I wanna go back to your, um, I guess you called it the perfect storm and I couldn't agree more. And it made me wonder how many of these perfect storms may be waiting to happen around the country because you know, some of the, of course, we don't have um, declining car industry everywhere, but we have some of the other elements, uh, the segregation, the growth of the suburb suburban areas, and also, of course, the uh, um, aging, be it cast iron pipes, lead pipes, and so on. So it is, it, how probable it is that it may be repeating somewhere else? I think, um... Because of Flint, the Safe Drinking Water Act has gotten even stricter. So the problems they had with lead pipes is being addressed, but the infrastructure costs and the infrastructure itself is failing. Many of the infrastructure, not only water systems, stormwater systems, but if you look at the US highway systems, a lot of these systems were built in the 60s. And in water systems, 
For example, where I worked in the city of Tampa, a lot of the pipes were cast iron. The life of a cast iron pipe is about 30 years. So in Tampa, the pipes were put in in the 20s and they still haven't been replaced. And this is happening all over the country. There's not enough money in the budget to do systematic replacement of pipes. So what happens is water department directors try to stretch the length of service of a pipe. So what they do, and this is part of the Safe Drinking Water Act, they put down a layer of calcium inside a pipe. They make hard water. So this puts down calcium inside of the pipe and it helps protect the pipe from breaking and leaking. But the, the cost is astronomical. For example, to replace one mile of a major water main is about a million dollars. And if a city has 2,000 miles of pipes, you can see that the federal funding and city funding is not adequate to replace these systems. And, you know, it, I was checking what's the latest on what happened in Flint. And um, I learned that a few weeks ago, at least seven individuals were discharged from um, the felony accusations in this um, whole debacle. And it makes me wonder, okay, you know, we all have probably the same thing um, in com we have a lot in common with that situation here in Hawaii. We have a lot of aging and cast iron pipes um, that need to be replaced sooner rather than later. And a lot of uh, developments and community associations are going through that. And, but what is the incentive for these elected officials to do the right thing when there's no consequences, it seems like? They, they're all, you know, um, for them, there were no consequences. Maybe, I don't know, I hope that they feel guilty about it, even if they're not legally responsible. Right, I think, um, I mean, it is a hard balance between, partly because the short-sightedness of, of elected officials, not all of them, but if you're running every four years, it's hard to think about, I need to replace this water pipe and it's gonna be good for the next 30 years. I think the, the attempted prosecution of some of those that blatantly ignored the test or actually cheated on the test for Flint should be a warning to other elected officials. But I mean, that's, that's the, the danger of, a, and I guess that's one of the, the problems with our system is the, the need to do the right thing versus budgetary constraints. But even here, for example, in Honolulu, there's recently been the uh, Red Hill contamination of the aquifer by the Navy. And here, again, you have the, the hero of the moment is uh, the chief engineer of the Honolulu uh, Board of Water Supply. And he stood up to the Navy and he stood up to all that political pressure. And he said, no, you're gonna shut down the well, you're gonna clean it up and you're gonna do it now. And I think, you know, if it's a case of extreme um, pollution or a case of the city of Flint with lead poisoning and um, other problems with the water, for example, they let the, the chlorine lapse and then that caused the Legionnaires to, um, disease outbreak as well. So the fine balance, I think you need to get elected officials behind it and campaign on, you know, prevention, prevention of harm and, you know, the health, health and safety of the citizens. But that's, that's hard. And I think the author mentions that there's never a ribbon cutting when you do a new water pipe. You know, if you, you build a library or, you know, put a wing on a hospital that a lot, everybody comes out and they, they cut the ribbon and there's great applause and, you know, money is raised for a, a new symphony hall, but nobody cheers and, and says, wow, look, a new 40 inch water main. <laughs> so I think, I think it's interesting. It's, it's so invisible, like the author pointed out, it's so invisible, it's almost magic. We just take it for granted. We don't see it. We don't think about it. It's not visible. It's all underground. And I think that's one of, that's one of the problems with celebrating you know, the, the magic of safe water. And I feel that we don't have enough experts in this area either. I feel like you know, none of these 
kids going to college right now are saying, I want to become a hydrologist or I want to become a water quality engineer. You know, it requires a lot of skill and a lot of um, competence, right? But yet, you know, these are not glamorous jobs. Right. They're, they're non glamorous, but I think they attract people with a great sense of duty and public service. And I find it disheartening when, when people say, oh, they're a government worker, you know, as if government workers don't care. And I think most of them are incredibly dedicated, you know, and they want to do the right thing, especially if you get to a highly specialized field like water quality assurance. I know the, um, this job often requires a PhD in biology or chemistry, microbiology. Sometimes you have to be an engineer and a PhD. So these are, as you mentioned, they're, they're very high um, jobs with the, that require high education and the pay is, is quite well. It's about, if you're a water quality assurance officer, at least in Florida, it's about $170,000 a year as your salary. But you're right, it's not something that you go to career day at school and somebody says, how about being a civil engineer? <laughs> it's, not, it's not glamorous. Everybody says, do you want to be a doctor or a lawyer? Um, but, you know, engineering or, you know, lab work is, is typically not, at least when I was in school, that wasn't, um, that wasn't anything I heard about in career day. So we don't have uh, enough clean water and... We, all, we basically don't have enough fresh water too. Um, during my last show where I um, had a discussion with retired Major General John Harrell about threats to, threats to US, um, and we discussed mostly about security threats, and I've asked him where does he see US in the next 20 years? What would be the biggest issue? Uh, for United States. And I was surprised by his answer. Um, it wasn't a country or an entity. His answer was um, fresh, wa fresh water challenges. So it, it really got me thinking about, you know, how, again, how important this is for, not for US only, but I think the entire world. Yes, um, one of the, posters I had in my office. It was a Remitine painting and it was called The Fight for the Waterhole. And it had uh, guys in the Wild West, you know, and they had their Conestoga wagons surrounding the waterhole and they were protecting it from the Native Americans. And the even back then in the, the Wild West, there was a saying that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And I think that's another thing that we take for granted. For example, in Hawaii, how, you know, how many thousands of population can these aquifers serve before they start to get depleted? In many states, especially along the Eastern seaboard, they pump so much water out of the aquifer that they're getting saltwater intrusion. And once you get saltwater into an aquifer, you can't really clean it. Um, it's the same with with Red Hill, they polluted an, uh, an aquifer here, they polluted some wells. And if we pump, if the water department or the Florida water supply engineer explains, if we pump the other wells harder to make up for it, there's the problem of drafting the contaminants into the other, into the other wells or into the aquifer. So it's, um, it's an incredible um, problem in the, in the United States. If you look at the West, some of those aquifers have been drawn down about 300 feet. So the many areas in the Midwest are at risk of running out of potable water. And the water department director I work for said, it's time to move to Canada because Canada is going to be supplying the US with fresh water. Um, you know, they have low population and a huge amount of fresh water supply. So, Water yep. is much yeah, more valuable, Hawaii. right? <laughs> Water is much more valuable than than um, gasoline or any of the fossil fuels because there's no replacement. With fossil fuels, you can replace it with solar or wind. There is no replacement for potable water. There's nothing. 
Yes. And that um, I don't want to end the show on a sad note here. <laughs> I just want to say um, that for me, this book was very well written. I learned a lot from it. Um, there wasn't anything in particular that I felt like I need, like, oh, maybe I, sh I should look into this. This doesn't sound true. Or um, how, how, how did you see it? It was incredibly well researched. I was, I was impressed that the, I think the, the footnotes at the back of the book are about a quarter of the, of the book itself. Okay. But the, the research into the Safe Drinking Water Act, the research into civil rights, um, the segregation, um, it, all facets of the book were in, incredibly well researched. And then the, the nuances of, of politics, and it's, it's very hard to find some of that information. It was interesting also in talking about the quote, heroes of, of the book, the press, and especially Michigan Public Radio. And it was interesting to me that the public radio station was able to continue with the story. And that was one thing, one thing that's hard about water, if there's water contamination, the amount of time and the number of years it takes to actually bring a case. And there's a saying in law that justice delayed is justice denied. And I think that that's one of the problems with, with Flint and with any type of pollution, the evidence and the years and years of lawsuits and water testing and following the growth of development of a child that has been contaminated with lead poisoning, all of those things that take time and the attention span of the American public to follow a story from, you know, little Johnny that's three year old that has lead poisoning and now he's seven and he's having problems in school to keep the public's attention on something like polluted water supply is very hard to do. If you look at the news, there are sound bites, the stories are, are 30 minutes and I mean, 30 seconds. So. It's, um, it's incredibly hard in these environmental justice cases to continue the interest of the public. And if a case takes seven years to bring to court, an elected official is only there for four. So it's very hard to keep up the, to get the public interested and keep up that, that interest so that justice is served. That's a very good point. It's, you know, it's a long haul. Um, issue it, it's a yeah it's a long-term problem that we should not find a short-term solution to so well kathy thank you so much for joining me today this has been wonderful and thank you for all of your insights and your expertise that added to what the um, book brought to me and um to our readers um you know particularly given what's happening in hawaii you should read this book I was going to say, um, I don't think anybody should be put off about the title, The Poison City, and, and it's about water and, you know, water systems. The book is so well read. It's a, it's a page turner. It's a thriller. It's an investigative story. So I think um, I tell the readers not to, be, not to be put off by the fact that it's dealing with utility systems or water testing because it is it's a it's a mystery it's a modern mystery there are good guys there's bad guys there's investigative reporters there's community activists and it all comes together and it's a story of all american cities any american city and i think i think that's one of the things it it is so well written it is it's an it's an exciting read and you know i know i'm a water nerd so for me, I found it fascinating, but I think for anybody, it's the, the investigation that the author does is just amazing and how she pulls it all together with the historical references. So yeah, it's yeah. not just for, it's not just for nerds. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, and it's not fiction. It's, it happened and we have a lot to learn from what happened there. So thank you again, Kathy. And um, until next time, Ahui ho!
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.